media mode. covers your story, your story will be oh, covered from the ground up. We're back for all new show. Now, you know, here at the Jason Lee Show, we have lots of fun, but today is an honor because we've had everybody from Cardi B. We've had champs, boxing, boxing champs, everybody, even Blueface and Grishon, but today we get to talk to an icon, and I actually checked the list of everybody I've interviewed. This is the first living, breathing icon, and an honor to have the one and only Babyface in the building. <laughs> now, everybody watching at home, Jennifer Lewis, Car Cardi B, Floyd, everybody's going to be like, I thought I was an icon. You are iconic in your <laughs> way, but when you look at your contribution to music and culture and just the lives of people all over the world, I don't think we've had anybody that's had the impact that you've had. Well, that's nice to hear. I don't, I don't think of myself that way, but... You don't? I, I just don't think that deep about it, to be honest. You just do the work. I, I don't understand. See, I know that... See, God blesses people like you abundantly the way that you've been blessed and not somebody like me because I think if I've made songs <laughs> like Whip Appeal and all the other songs that have had people gyrating hips for, for decades, mm -hmm. I would be moving through these streets a little bit more entitled. You don't feel that way? No, I don't feel that way. Maybe I should have a little you and me, but no. <laughs> no I'm okay, so I, I, I met uh, Babyface um, a couple times now, but the last time I met, we were at a, a birthday party for Ernest, who works with you, who's been a friend of mine for a long time. And yeah. I remember telling you a story of my cousin Pat, who's sitting at home right now, uh, probably standing on her counter singing Whip Appeal, who at every family <laughs> function would put on Whip Appeal and perform it. Um, and so I just know that that's when I first came to understand just the power you had over wow. women. Oh, I didn't, I didn't know that to that extent. I don't know they're doing it, you know, doing it still to this day. Yeah, of yeah. course. <laughs> but when you started making music, um, and, and, and you've been doing it for a while. When you yeah, started yeah. making music, was your intention to make music, love music for women, for people, for couples, for weddings? What was, what was the idea behind your creativity? Yeah, when I started writing music in the beginning, it was always for women. It was always for, cause I was, I, I wrote my first song cause I fell in love with the girl. Mm -hmm. So it was always that, you know, uh, the romantic side of it. So that's, that's all I knew, you know. Now, when you look at songwriting from when you were writing music early on to where people are writing music now, I saw recently Charlemagne, they had a whole conversation around the, um, that, that nobody's making iconic music right now because everything is focused on TikTok algorithms and not really focused yeah, yeah. on legacy. Do you agree with that? I think you can find it here and there. I think some people are still, some people are still trying to be creative, but it's, it's hard to get a, a voice these days. You know, it's hard to cut through it all. Mm -hmm. But I, I wouldn't put that on every artist and say that every artist is not trying to trying to create. And, you know, it is hard. There is an algorithm that you have to deal with at this particular point. That algorithm used to be DJs, mm -hmm. you know, that would decide whether you'd get on radio, you know, get on radio. So so it's a completely different thing at this point, you know. But what's what what is your thoughts on somebody like you that's so iconic in music when you look at music today? Because we recently had Chloe Bailey here and she's somebody yeah. who I look at as a real talented singer, producer. Yeah, she yeah. knows music. She understands technique. Um, and I look at her as one far and few from the rest of a lot of the other artists that are out. When you look at music today and you look at the time where you had Luther Vandross's or you had the Whitney Houston's, mm -hmm. what do you think has been the biggest difference um, that's changed music? Maybe not for the best. Um, well, I would say for a while, everything was kind of sounding the same, but I feel like there are artists that are doing different things and little by little it's changing. So I don't think, I don't think we're stuck in it. Um, you know, there are artists like Chloe, Chloe Bailey that, you know, are coming out and, and a number of other artists that are doing different things. So I don't, I think we get stuck on saying everything's not as good. And I never get caught in that because, you know, to the kids that are listening to it right now, it's it's better to them. And so you gotta be careful about trying to think of what you think is good and put it on somebody else. Do you, do you think that's generationally? Cause I think that's true. There are kids listening to music now that say it's good to them. Yeah. But then for me, it may not be good. I'll say, oh, well, 90s music was better. Then there'll be people from earlier in my life that will say, well, back in the 60s, our music, is it generationally people just feel that way? I, I think it happens that way. I just try to listen to it for a long time. If I heard something that I didn't understand, that, that I didn't like, but everybody else loved it, then I'd keep on listening to it to figure out what am I missing? Because there's something that's moving everybody. And, and if you listen long enough, you'll usually find it. 
You know? And we were looking at all the pictures of Babyface over the years. You take pictures with glasses on all yeah. the time. Is uh -huh. that like your? Is that your cape? Like Superman got his cape. Is glasses your thing? Is that a part of your swag? That's my thing. It's always been a uh, part of it. Started early days, and I remember seeing a picture of the the Jackson Five. They all had those glasses on. So, oh, I got to do that. You know, they were so cool with it, and I want to be cool. So. So is, um, but I know you were also really shy growing up. Is that part yeah. of it? Because there is a sort of comfort in people not being able to look you straight in the eyes. I don't do a lot of direct eye contact when I'm talking to people outside of interviews. Even when I have my glasses off, I got my glasses off. Really? Yeah. How? Even when my glasses are off, they're still on. It's like I still, um, I'm protected. Mm. You know, I'm, I'm cautious with words that I say and how I say things because I don't want to be taken the wrong way, you say something the wrong way, and then people, you know, it, it goes other places. Isn't it so. a lot of pressure being a superstar like that where you have to watch everything? Because I think about fame, and somebody like you that's been famous for so long, you can't just walk down the street, you can't just go to a grocery store, you can't say to somebody that they're a piece of shit when you probably want <laughs> to. I get to because I'm not famous. Uh, people know me, but I'm not famous. Is there a certain level of pressure that influences how you think about what you say before you say it? Now, part of it for me, not not necessarily part of it's hard for me to be a mean person, period, uh, and to say nasty things about anyone. Um, I I would always say the, the best thing my mom, uh, the thing that God gave me was a forgiving heart, you know, so because no matter what, I can always forgive people for something. So I don't have to carry that negativity with me. And that's did you get that in therapy or is that just who you are? Because I'm in therapy. My therapist <laughs> is teaching me that right now. And, and, and he always tells me, text me before you act out. I, I'm texting him after I act out now. I'm trying to get it before. Is that something you got in therapy or does just you that's, that's who raised that way? That's how I was, how I was raised. That's, that's how I grew up. And sometimes it can be to a fault, you know, but um, it's, it's, I own it and, you know, I'm OK with it. Mm. So back to the glasses thing. I don't know if this is appropriate to ask you, but this is Jason Lee's show. You make love music. Do you prefer <laughs> glasses on when you're making love, or do you? Do we get, do we take the glasses off then? I, I, I hear his girlfriend in the background. I should have <laughs> asked her, but it's his interview. I told you once before, my glasses are always on, even when they ain't on. No shade. Okay. <laughs> so I was looking over the list of everybody you've worked with. You've worked with every almost every artist, at least every, and I know this is Jason Lee talking, every artist that matters to music, Madonna, <laughs> Mariah, um, Tony, Braxton, uh, Whitney Houston, I mean the list, I have the list here, I'm not gonna read it because we don't have that much time, Celine Dion. Um, out of all those people, who did you like the best? I mean, it's Aretha Franklin, Shaka Khan, there's just too many here. Yeah, it's too, many, it's, it's too many to mention, and there's, it was a lot of fun with all of them. Um, Every, you know, every session was, was special. It was great working with Whitney. Um, the first time I worked with Mariah, same, same thing with Celine. The, the cool part is when you get in these rooms with these artists and, and you get to, I'm so lucky because I get to sit across that, in, in that board, that, right in front of that board and, and listen to these amazing voices. And that's just, it's just right there in my face. Mm -hmm. And that I even get to suggest them to them, maybe try this, try that. It's just crazy to be, to have experienced that in the first place. But as a songwriter and a producer, when you're writing with a Celine Dion or a Whitney Houston or a Mariah or an Aretha who are very powerful yeah. uh, presence and singers and, and, and stuff like that, how do you, because you seem like a very humble person, very uh, mellow, how do you, how do the egos meet? Are there creative egos that meet and how do you work through that? We usually talk before we get started. And we have a, have a pretty good time. I mean, we just talk about life and whatever's going on and usually get, get loose and get silly. And, and it ends up being fun. I mean, Aretha, like she, she kind of controls it. I mean, she'll come in the room and say, look, I'm only going to do it two times. That's you know, it. Run to two times and then, and like, can I get three? Two times. <laughs> and, but she would give me the three, third one. But so she's like, she knew what she wanted. She like would sing the song from the beginning to the end. And she was just old school that way. And Whitney, she loved to get it done. She didn't want to be in there singing. Kind of like Johnny Gale, he don't like to sing mm -hmm. either. But so some people, they don't, they hate the studio. 
but you know, it's the process you got to go through just to get it done. Now, back in the day when people would record, they would sing a song all the way through. Now you can do little parts here and there and then put it all together, right? Yeah. Did that change? Did that make it easier for singers to be singers? Because I went to the studio with Don Robinson from En Vogue one time, and she was doing a song. Uh, I forgot the name of the producer. Donnie Scamps was the producer, and she did like 30 times. It was like 30. It was so much that I decided I no longer ever want to be in a studio. Again. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, I, I, I'm guilty of that. We will, we will do it again and again. Really? You know, trying to get to the right thing. So, um, but you got to work that hard sometimes to get that perfect performance. Uh, recently, Celine Dion was in the news. She canceled her world tour because yeah. she had, I think it was called Stiff Something Syndrome, where yeah. she was she's having some health issues. Yeah. Um, what do you think about that? It seems like she's leaving music early. I mean, it's 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 sad because she's incredible. She's one of those voices that when when I worked in the studio with her, I, I, she could sing anyway. But when I was in the studio with her, she was perfect. It was like I, I don't there's. There's only a few singers that really kind of hit me, like where they they never do anything wrong. They're never out of pitch, everything. It's just a perfect vocal. And she's one of those one of those singers and an amazing person. Um, her spirit is just sweet. Mm. So um, it's sad to see that she's, uh, she's going through this, you know, mm -hmm. at this point, because that's one of those voices that we want to hear out there, you mm -hmm. know. You know. So now that you've been in, you've been in the business, you've, you have 12 Grammys, you've won almost every award that's out there. Do you ever feel like pressure to do more? I mean, what else can you do at this point? I don't feel pressure to do more, but I love doing more. I, I, I love writing and I love, you know, collaborating and going in the studio with, uh, with other writers and producers and artists. So it's, it's fun for me. So it's not like it's never really work in that sense. And so it's one of those things that I'm, I'm blessed to still be able to do to this to this day. Was there ever pressure in your career as you were rising to do anything or you I mean, to, to reach any of these awards? Because I know like a lot of artists now, if they don't get a Grammy nomination, it becomes a headline. If they don't get acknowledged by the AMAs, there's a scandal. If it, if the billboard doesn't if they don't make it top 100, you know, they are a failure. Like, was there ever that pressure in your career where you just focus on art? Not really for me, because like I was like always that artist that was kind of writing under. I worked with the superstars and I, I would do my music. So I was kind of like a producer writer first and then an artist. And so if it worked, it was great. But if it didn't, I was also writer producer. So I didn't have to depend on it the same way. And um, and once again, I'm in I'm in the studio with like tremendous superstars. So I ain't competing with them, you know? <laughs> I'm just like, you know, they go do that thing. So I don't have to worry about it the same way. So anytime they try to pressure you, you just say, check my discography and then walk out the room, then come back. I don't do that. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to teach Babyface how to be shady. That's why I got him here today. Okay, so as I was going down the list of all the songs that I loved and, and getting ready today, mm -hmm. and I didn't know you did My My My. Yeah. I don't know why I didn't know that. I didn't know it either. Is it because writers, you're the writer that stays in the background. You're not like a writer that was on Death Row or Bad Boy where you want everybody to know that you wrote the song. Yeah, I, I, it wasn't the kind, that wasn't how we did it. You know, it was, where it's like, you know, it, 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 it did change at one particular point, you know, with the producers and writers where, you know, you just kind of like, you know, you say it out loud. But I think at some point through the 90s, you know, uh, when I was producing with L.A., we followed Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis because they they became producers that everybody knew about. You know, they they became Jam. the brand. They were yeah. brand. Yeah. And so it's like, yeah, we wanted to be that, you know. And then so there's, you know, L.A. and Babyface. And then it was Teddy Riley, you know, and and like that was like kind of the thing of being one of those one of those guys, mm -hmm. you know. And but that was more about being producing, not so much about writing songs. Yeah, and when and actually when you bring up Teddy Riley, which we hey Teddy, we love you. When you and Teddy Riley did the whole verses, that was probably the most iconic verses that I remember where there it wasn't a beef. There were the technical difficulties, but yeah, and yeah. then you caught COVID after. But other than that, everything that 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 I think was when a lot of people were sitting at home in despair and remembered the love that we have for music and the yeah, entertainment and yeah. true artistry. How did you receive the response you got from people that were watching? I mean, there were like I think a million people at one point watching this live. I, I was amazed that um I was amazed that it, that it went that big. Um, 
it was something that, um, you know, Andre Harrell, you know, rest in peace, he, he, he pushed me to do. And it was something that, you know, I had nothing but love for Teddy and his music. And so it was like, it was great to be a part of, part of that and to showcase both of our music, you know, at that point. So you brought up LaFace, and I know you you and um, L.A. Reid had the label back then, and you were you know building artists and doing that. Yeah. Do you miss that? Do you label? miss that? Do you miss that label in that time? I don't uh, I don't miss doing the labels because I don't like being on the other side. Uh, I like being an artist, and I don't like being a suit because sometimes you know decisions have to be made that aren't necessarily in the artist's interests. Mm -hmm. And I don't like being on that side. Were you the person that dealt most with the business or did you do the, you did I, the music I was more, more creative. I didn't get so into the business. I mean, you have to be part of the business and you get, um, you know, so, so that's part of it. But I didn't always, um, didn't always love the position that we were put in being a joint venture. Mm -hmm. And you had to deal with what the, uh, you know, the label would kind of tell you what you had to do with your artists. Were you the good cop and LA was the bad cop? It might have looked that way. It mm -hmm. might have came off that way. I don't think anybody can look at you as a bad cop. Well, I, I've yeah. never heard that you were like a bad cop. I've heard that LA was a bad cop. But when you guys <laughs> were the partners, were you the good cop tied in with the bad cop? And sometimes when things didn't roll out the way that maybe you would want them to, you took the hit too? I would take the hit because I was, you know, I was part of the face. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we, we had, um, you know, it was a great label and we did... Um, have great artists that came from it. But in, in the situation that we were in, because we were a joint venture, sometimes we were put in a position where we ended up not being able to give the artists everything that we wanted to give them. Mm -hmm. And so, hence we had, you know, issues with uh, TLC. We got sued by TLC. We got sued by Tony Braxton because they weren't getting everything that they thought they should get. Mm -hmm. And I thought they should get it too. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't, but that wouldn't be from the record company side. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm shouldn't be thinking that way right you know but um but it was part, it was part of like kind of growing up you know um in this business it was a whole new thing we we had never done that before mm -hmm. so it was it was learning it and uh, where are you now with tlc i mean we've had t-boz on the show we haven't had chili um but where are you all with with the relationship now i'm good with uh both of them mm -hmm. um we were always good uh it was there was never in my when I can know, I, there was never a point where we ever had any beef with each other. And then when you look back over the music that you created with them, and we're going to get to the amazing music you're creating today, um, do you think the development for artists in making that iconic music that's going to last forever is happening? Because I don't, yeah. I don't see it. And maybe I'm missing it because I'm not as ingrained in music as maybe you are. But if it is happening, we're not seeing it happening in real time. Um, it's artists don't get that much of a chance to really um, practice anymore you know, to work on their trade, so to say. Mm -hmm. And they're kind of just, they blow up real quick and they're there and they gotta be ready to go. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's hard to be ready when you don't have a place to, a playground to play and, and actually, you know, you know, make mistakes. Mm -hmm. you, you have to make mistakes in front of everybody right from the get go. So. And, and when you look at groups like like Boyz II Men, who we work with, or As Yet, and that, if, you, if you don't know who As Yet is, I don't mm -hmm. know what rock you live under. This is one of my favorite. <laughs> Um, R&B groups from from that era, but when you look at the melodies of m four people, four guys or four yeah, yeah. girls, can that exist in today's music? I hope so. I don't. I don't know that that's. I, I. I don't know that that's the, the flavor at the moment. But it just has to be done once, maybe, and maybe the door will be open. Mm -hmm. um, but it, that's all I can do is I hope I hope we can come back. So I know I talked about Babyface being shy earlier. Another artist that's shy, run into her at the gym from time to time is SZA. Uh, SZA, she does not do these interviews. <laughs> SZA, is, she came up to me and told me she loves me and she loves my shows, but she's not coming on. We no, love no. you, SZA. <laughs> you work with SZA on, on Snooze, which hit the uh, top 100 Billboard chart. How was it working with SZA and how did that come together? SZA, I went to SZA to ask her to be part of the uh, actually Girls' Night Out album. And, when she came, so she came over to the uh, studio and we uh, recorded a couple songs. And Snooze was one of those songs. Mm -hmm. And SZA is, I think she's genius. Um, she sat in there with Snooze. She really just kind of wrote that thing herself. You know, I just played guitar and did some uh, help create the track. But other than that, she is 
she's an incredible writer. I don't know that, uh, and an, an incredible uh, artist. I love her voice. Um, I don't know that there are very many scissors out there today. I don't know that there, there have ever been scissors before. Really? Yeah, it's, it's like, she has a thing about her voice and a, and a, and a thing about how she, how she uses her melodies and how she phrases. It's all hers, it's all her own. And it's all, and I was just, um, I was blown away by her, you know, and, and her talent, it's just, it's incredible. But, that, but you're babyface, so you're, you're so iconic that at this point, are, are artists reaching out to you or do you hand select who you work with? So like, do you pick a scissor? Or does she come to you and say, I want to be a part of this project? I, that, was, that was me going to her and oh, wow. her being gracious enough to even just come in. Because the, the cool part for me at this point is, is to be able to uh, work with younger artists, you know, and who are, and still have an interest in getting in the studio with me. That's not always, that's not the norm. So um, I'm blessed to be able to kind of get those calls and be able to work with younger artists. Well, we've had a young artist here that I, some, somebody told me, you know, Krishan <laughs> yes. Rock. Right. How and who in your life put you <laughs> on to Krishan Rock? I don't know how or, or who, I just found it and found her in Blueface and I, I, I couldn't stop watching. <laughs> You guys keep telling me online, stop posting Blueface Krishan. And now I bring an icon on the show who's worked with everybody from Celine to Luther to Mariah and SZA and everybody else that we know. And he knows Blueface and Krishan. Okay, I don't want to be disrespectful, but I got you here and I wanted to know if you could, do you know her song, um, It's a Vibe? Of course I do. Doesn't everybody know It's a Vibe? All the time. All right. Well, listen, I, I, I didn't uh, ask this before you got here, but um, I actually have a guitar. Can somebody please bring me a guitar? What? Can, can, you, um, can you play some of it? This is, okay, this is a left-handed guitar. I play right-handed, but I'll I try to figure it out. Only so. an icon that can play a left-handed guitar. Okay. Um, wait, let me set this up, because I know you've been introduced by presidents, everybody else. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Please welcome Blueface. Wait. <laughs> Blueface. Now, see, that's funny because like Bruno just had a show, and he 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 called me and said, "So were you in the audience last night?" I said, "No." He said, uh, "Well, they told me you were there, but then I found out it wasn't you. It was Blueface." <laughs> they thought, "Okay, this show is going down the hill." <laughs> okay, all right. First time I ever introduced an icon, I call him Blueface. And, and, and Bruno, you call him Blueface. Okay. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Babyface playing It's a Vibe. Okay. I'm going to do it my way. It's a vibe all the time. It's a vibe all the time. It's a vibe. It's a vibe. It's a vibe. It's a vibe. It's a vibe all the time It's a vibe all the time It's a vibe 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 Okay, the only thing I have to say, and please, Krishan, I know you about to have to tell you this week you about to have a baby. <laughs> Don't get mad at me. You cannot do a remix to this song. <laughs> Because no. TikTok is about to go crazy demanding the, uh, uh, this repost. The whole internet, I know right now that this one live is going crazy. That's crazy that you know that song. But it's kind of hooky, right? It is. Yes. Well, like that. <laughs> because you know what I love about this song and what I love, what I love about her is she stepped out kind of doing her own thing with the yeah. rock vibe. Right. But to slow it down and put that on it, that was a different thing. Yeah, well, you know, it's still a good song. Yeah. So that's what I heard when I, when I heard that. And... She's just, in, uh, both of them are interesting people, but particularly her, you know, she's, she's interesting to watch. The fact that she just, she doesn't care and she, she just goes for it and, does, and is um, always herself. See, what the, 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 I'm glad you said that. And I'm glad that we're having this, being yourself, because now I feel comfortable. I ain't gonna lie, I was a little <laughs> nervous today, because I'm, you know, when you interview somebody like you who is, important to the world. You know, I, I interview a lot of people that are important to the world, but like you're somebody who has just transcended um, race, at, you know, countries, um, 
sexuality. He's like, everybody loves you. So I, there's a certain level of responsibility that I have to have to the interview, right? Mm. But something you just said resonated with me because last night at about midnight, I called a friend of mine named Catherine Bruton. I don't know if you know Catherine. She's the senior vice president at BMI. Uh-huh. She's somebody that I trust and I one of my sounding boards. And I called her, I said, I really struggle sometimes with being myself and who I believe I am with the expectations and pressure of the industry. Mm. And then you just said something about Krishan. You said that she's she's just herself and i think that there's there is a pressure that comes with elevation and when your yeah. brand gets bigger that people start to expect different out of you yeah i th- but you shouldn't go with by their expectations you should only go by your own expectations that's what she said yeah okay so i'm going to blame babyface and Catherine bruton for continuing to be me and pressing all your buttons <laughs> but no the reality is you Press know all. The, 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 there's there's folks like you who who do have, um, uh, who don't come off ratchet, mm-hmm. wild, but you guys love the ratchet. Like you, Rihanna's, y'all watch the Krishan and Blue Faces. Yeah. And the, is yeah. it escapism? Like, do you enjoy watching it and just going, like, that's a train wreck I could never be it's, a part it's, of? But. It's, it's culture. Mm. It's listening to how people talk and what they, and the, the, new, the new words that they say and, mm-hmm. and how things are, it's, it's life. And, um, I think t- to shut yourself off of it is is crazy, um, and and it's not like I it's not like I watch and make fun of it, mm-hmm. you know. I just watch it and see just these personalities, these rich personalities, mm-hmm. as within with anyone else and anywhere anywhere else. So, um, I don't know what else to say that, but I just didn't. I've enjoyed them. But I always say that black people were not a monolith. The culture is not one sided. You know, it's, oh, no. it's all of it. And I do yeah. feel like we have to learn how to embrace it all. Right. Yes. Agree. Yeah. OK. Um, I said recently, too, that I thought the culture was in a critical condition because I felt like cancel culture is just ruining art. Completely. When you look at cancel culture, what do you think about it? It's terrible. It is. Uh, it, it's killing art and killing um an artist in that sense. Um, and I know sometimes there should always be a line, and, but we, we don't know where that line is anymore. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's, it's all blurred mm-hmm. at this particular point. And I don't know how we get back from it. Mm-hmm. Uh, we just need to just stop, mm-hmm. you know, and just um, find the middle ground. Mm-hmm. Um, don't go too far one way or the other. Um, people just aren't, People aren't aren't decent with each other anymore. People aren't nice to each other anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, social media in general is a place where voices are heard, where people are angry in their lives, and they take that out on other people, mm-hmm. and and um, and find something that they can attack. and And so it's um, so it's sad in that way to see see what it's turned into. Um, I remember seeing something on David Boy saying, you know, uh, years ago where he said that, you know, the Internet and social media is going to be like a most amazing thing, but it's also going to be the scariest thing ever. Mm. And he was not wrong. It was almost like he called Miss Cleo and got the future. Yes. Because it really is just a place. It's a playground now where people can say whatever they want. Yes. Including Anita Baker. (laughs) You had to do that. (laughs) Now, you know, uh, we had this plan, this interview planned way before Miss Anita ventured <laughs> over to Twitter. Uh, but thank God uh, you were able to come here today while she was. I'm, you know, you're you're an icon in R&B, but you're now in an r and beef. <laughs> nice. Good word. <laughs> Good morning, America. Called an r and t- I was looking on R&B. TV and they said that you're in the middle of an r and beef with Anita Baker. Now, this is the craziest thing I saw online. Let me set it up. I was on Facebook perusing my, seeing what my family was doing. And I saw a post that said, the first post was, it wasn't from Anita. It was something about, uh, you guys were on tour together and there were technical difficulties which prevented you from going on stage. And so she decided, or it was decided that she would go on and you would not go on. The idea that one, you're not a co-headliner is crazy to somebody like me because you're both iconic. And in fact, I did my research. You got far more awards than she does um, and far more hits. But but when I looked at that, I didn't understand why it wasn't a cold liner situation. And then I also didn't understand how it was that you could just be removed when we all know your fans are going to be in the audience, too. Well, I mean, that was 
that was a complicated evening. Um, first of all, I, I have no problem being a support act for Anita Baker. I have that much love and respect for her art. And it was her show. So uh, I, I have no issue with that. And I think that um, I was looking as forward to watch Anita every night as well, because I love her as a writer and uh, as an artist. It's, it's, it's a beautiful experience. In terms of what happened that night, it was really things got out of hand because there was a technical issue in the terms of like there was a video wall, this big video wall that Anita uses every night. It wasn't working and they spent the whole day trying to get it together. We arrived there probably at 12 noon, ready to go. And by time it was time to go on the show, seven o'clock, show was supposed to start at seven, uh, it wasn't fixed. And it was, there was a panic going on. We said, we gotta get this thing fixed. And so we had to wait. We didn't even get on stage to even uh, do a sound check. We did a line check. And uh, I know this all sounds like talking and stuff, but um, we did our line check around 7, 7.30, uh, because they held, the, held everybody outside, said we need a little bit more time. And uh, so we did the line check and we were ready to go. But they kept on working on this video uh, wall. And that video wall wasn't fixed. So we tried to go on while they could maybe work on it while we were on stage, but nope, we want to start the whole show right. So ultimately all the time was lost. By the time the realization came that it wasn't going to be fixed, it was nine o'clock. And the audience is waiting this whole the time? The audience is sitting out there probably from 7.30, 7.45. They were sitting all this time. But why couldn't they fix this wall while you were performing? What did it require a lot of noise? Uh, I do. I would have been fine. I would have taken the noise, but that wasn't an option. So wait, they didn't even come to you and say, "We're going to go ahead and work on this." You have the option to go out. We and offered perform. that. Really? We offered like we'll, we'll go on stage, we'll perform, and you can do it while we're there. But that wasn't that wasn't an option. So basically, and I'm not there. It, it, it wanted the show to look right and. Um, to be fair, no one wants any people working on something while you're on stage, but in order to get the show going, because people were ready to go. But to be fair, wanted to put on a good show. And so time just ran out. By the time, you know, came to the realization that wasn't going to be fixed, it was nine o'clock. So that decision had to be made. Are we going to do an extra, extra long show? I go up and then she goes up. She won't go on till 1030 or so. And that wasn't an option. And it was decided, I was asked, well, told, you know, you don't have to play tonight. You're not going to play tonight. Who told you that? Someone that was, I can't, uh, either some representative of the whole thing, the promoters or something came. But I mean, she didn't come over to your room and say, Kenny, I'm having a problem with my wall tonight. I really want to respect your set. I know you're willing to go out there. I'll tell the fans, because I know she didn't even tell the fans, they sent a man out there to do that. Well, did she didn't come over and give you the courtesy of she, like- uh, we, weren't, we weren't sitting in the room talking to each other about everything as was going on. Um, we definitely had talked a little bit earlier and she uh, kind of had said, you know, sorry for all this, you know, all the, the setbacks, because there were a lot of setbacks. It wasn't just the video wall, there were other things that were setbacks as well. Um, it was the first night starting again after we had we hadn't started in a while. So there were sometimes there's those kind of technical things that you just can't do anything mm. about, mm. and it was a lot of them. Um, but nevertheless, um, we went on. We were ready to go, and so it came to a point to where that decision had to be made, where she was going to go on or not. I thought that she, it was a decision that I was okay with the decision. I understood it. I didn't have a problem with it. The issue was for me, the only reason why I ultimately posted something because people were booing and after they, they announced that I wasn't coming on, then people were Oh, saying, the fans were pissed. They were pissed. Yeah. And then there were we, DMs coming and saying, uh, Babyface is a no-show. And I didn't want that to be the story. Mm -hmm. you know. So I didn't want to put it, I just tried to make an announcement to at least say, hey, couldn't go on tonight for technical difficulties. I was asked not to go on and that was, I thought your announcement had a lot of class. Even in right now how you're describing it, I'm telling you, I'm going to, me, you, and Ernest will get together. I'm going to teach you shade because <laughs> you, 
you you said something that I'm I'm gonna say what you said. You said you had no problem being an opening act or an opener for Anita Baker. You're not an opener, an opening artist. Mm-hmm. You know that. But you're you're doing you're saying that out of respect for somebody who is a legend. I'm doing it not just out of respect, because you know, look, she has great music and, and I have music as well. She's an artist that I love. And I and whether we share the stage together, when when we're if I go first. That's not a problem for me. To, and you want to call me an opener? That's not a problem because it's, we're sharing music. Everybody's getting to hear that music that evening. So it doesn't matter to me. You can say support, opener, I don't care. My, my love and respect for her is, is to the extent that, you know, where she is and what she's done uh, in her career and how she too has touched people with her music, I'm going to support that. That's that's just that's just who I am, and so. In all reality, for for everything to have gone as crazy as it did, that was never my intention to ever think that it would, mm-hmm. because that's not my heart. I don't even I, I can't believe it it rolled out the way that it rolled out. But hence, there's social media, mm-hmm. and that's what you know that's what happens at this point. But yeah. you're saying you didn't have a problem opening for her being an open act. Do you think she had a problem with you potentially or even I in in the inner your mind thinking of being a co-headliner? Do you think she would have a problem with you being a Look, it wasn't a co-headliner thing in, to begin with. It was her show. Okay. And and she asked me to join her show. But because you're so iconic, it would have been great to weave you into the show like where sh- you could have been playing music while it's sweet love and it could have been something for the fans to really i mean look those those are all things that you know hindsight you can look at it that way bottom line is that no question it was the nita baker show she uh as a matter of fact like the first dates that she did i wasn't really part of her first date she she did um i think she played in hollywood um florida and there were two dates that I wasn't on those shows. I wasn't I was never supposed to be a part of those shows. And some people think that I was supposed to be there, but I, I was never part of the show. So it was a Nita Baker show from the get go. And she asked me to join her. And that's what I did. She asked me to join as a support act. You know, what do you call it? Opener, support, whatever you want to call it. That's what I came on there as. I did not come on there with the intention that I'm a co-headliner. Mm-hmm. It was her show. Mm. That's clear, and, and I have no problem with that. Okay, so one of the fans went online and said, with all respect, did you call the babyface a support act? Because she went on and said that she, you know, she's, yeah. she's found Twitter. I don't know her, <laughs> who, who's doing her or Dionne Warwick's Twitter, but they have found <laughs> Twitter. And our aunties have just lost their mind. This is what she said on Twitter. She said, dearest one, anytime somebody started a text, a tweet, or anything with dearest one, that's them basically small girl in you that's how i get it uh mm-hmm. but anyway dearest one you are not privy to the contracts yes babyface is a special guest support act on my tour on my tour this false narrative of a co-headliner is creating unrealistic expectations and aggression from his fans towards me you sh- he should tell you guys the truth now one i i went and looked on twitter i didn't see you gaslighting fans i didn't see you releasing no. anything that would make people want to go and attack miss baker um and i've never heard of babyface fans being internet terrorists. So this was news <laughs> to me. Um, did you see that tweet? Yes. What did you think about it? I was saddened that um, that one could think that I could control fans or that even these people that are even saying these things to her are my fans to begin with. I don't know them. I don't know them personally. And usually if someone's coming with something negative, I don't pay attention to them. I don't. I don't give them air. I don't engage with them, you know, because, you know, if you start the fire, it's just going to get, it's just going to go worse. Uh, if you deal with ugly, it gets uglier. So, well, Auntie Baker found her Twitter again and mm-hmm. said, "Out of kindness and community, you gift them two hundred thousand dollars worth of production that you pay for, and still they complain and hold up the show and slander and villainize your name to social media, blogs, and press." Hashtag. Massa implantation. Who was she talking about? I don't know that one at all. The Massa, I. I... She even hashtag Massa, but you can't put an and, a and <laughs> in the middle of the word or else it won't allow you to hashtag it, Miss Baker. But I mean, I'm just teaching, Auntie. No, but I mean, again, I didn't see you gaslighting people to 
And the two hundred thousand dollars worth of production was that her board that wasn't working, or was this some other production? I I don't know. I, I, it's it's her production. I don't know. I don't know the cost of her production. Okay, um, Auntie, <laughs> there's a white man behind these grown black men harassing me and gaslighting my fans because he can't take over this tour, so he wants to destroy it. Kenny's crazy narcissist, babyface, call off your boys. I mean, I'm not laughing. I'm laughing. Yeah, you're laughing. No, I'm laughing. I'm laughing. This is this is oh. this is a lot. So but, so basically, what she's saying is, she asked you to be on her tour, and then you got on her tour. You just said you were okay being an opening act, but then you wanted to take it over with the white man. Yes, I don't I don't understand that. The white man, I guess he's talking about. Uh, he's not a white man. He's uh, my manager, Michael Perrin, who's uh, who's Persian. Um, but I guess you know, whatever. So. Um, I think that they had discussions in terms of whatever what was going to happen with the tour. I don't think that he never said anything and never said anything to fans or put any kind of, you know, um, anything out socially. So I don't know what that is, to be honest. And I don't, I feel uncomfortable even answering each one of these things because I feel like I'm I'm tweeting tweeting right now as we're speaking. No, what no, we're we're clearing <laughs> the air and I'm I I chose to bring these up because again, we saw all these tweets and of course I know of you within the industry and I know I've been watching you for years. I mean, I've never seen you do anything like this. So to yeah. have this put on your name, I feel because I've had a lot of people put things on my name. I, I, I do respond to everything because I enjoy it. This is what I do for a living. Yeah, yeah. But you don't. And I think when people are nice like you, people prey on that niceness because they know you're not going to say anything. I think. Yeah. I mean, look, most of the time it, I would rather be silent mm. and I usually like like it to just go away. But it hasn't been going away. It just kind of continues. Well, it, well Ms. Baker um, continued and called one of the fans a demon and said, um, <laughs> hey, demon, I'm going to put you on blast real quick. Um, she, and I won't say the whole thing because she went into Luther Vandross and all that, but she did say she treated you like a king. And she said, ask him. So I'm only doing what, Ms., what auntie said. <laughs> did she treat you like a king? We had great relationship. Okay. My relationship with um, with Anita has been fine. Um, I don't fight people. Mm. I don't. Um, we don't go at it. You know, we're very, very um, nice to each other. In terms of what happens uh, with the production and everything that, what whatever was agreed upon, it wasn't. I don't know if that if it was even with Anita. It might have been with, with Live Nation. Um, the promoters, I don't, I don't really get into all that. So my thing with Anita, personally, has been fine, mm. and I, I cannot speak ill of her, and I never will, no oh, matter what. You're so much better than I am. Maybe I take some of your classes, and then I'll give you one or two of mine. <laughs> okay. Okay, but I have to ask you. She said you don't like Beyonce. Now I, now that 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 did she, did she really say she that? She said she get with the tweet. So what happened was fans were online talking about Beyonce and out of nowhere, she jumped in that conversation and said, by the way, he hates Beyonce. He doesn't like Beyonce. I know I feel so stupid asking you this question, but as a journalist, I have to ask. Yes. Yeah. Do you hate Beyonce? Um, that was crazy. I couldn't <laughs> believe that was said. Um, and and immediately they're starting being bees. <laughs> uh, uh, I started getting bees. Uh, bee, what do you? you some beehive. The beehive. Beehives, yeah, yeah, they don't play. They they start to. I could hear some buzzing. Yeah. Uh, but I think even the buzzers knew that's not true, and so that's that's when it gets kind of crazy. Look, you know, it's you gotta, you really gotta stay work hard to try not to deal with those things because it it. it it's turning this business and turning what we're doing into an ugly thing. I mean, when you break it down, you're having these comments from people that aren't necessarily my fans. I don't know who they are, uh, but they're making comments to her um, about all kinds of things. And she's listening and she's hurt by it. Um, I hate that she's hurt by that. I wish she would just not look at it because I get those I get crazy comments, too. I just won't look at them. I won't I won't let those people 
get into my soul mm -hmm. that way. But because they did, you know, it, here we are. And so, um, and even though we're here right now, I would just hope that, you know, that one day that, you know, people can learn to not, not dig into that so much and not believe everything that they say or hear it. And the one thing is, the final thing I'll say on and we'll be done, um, because I'm, I'm uncomfortable even talking about it. But I think that just in general, we should leave, um, we should leave social media out of music, mm. uh, especially um, artists like ourselves. We, we're out here just to give music. Mm -hmm. I don't have any control over any of those fans or any of those people. They come to watch the music, then let's, let's just do that. Mm -hmm. you know? And the thing is, there's nothing I could say to say, hey, you stop it. I don't know who they even are. Yeah. You know? Uh, if it's a friend of mine, if it's somebody that I know, and I know they're coming at you, yeah, I'm gonna come at you. I'll, I'll go to them and definitely say, what are you doing? What's going on? But I don't know the stranger. And you don't I don't even know where to find them. I don't know where to find them or who they are, what, whatever it is, you know? And nor do I, nor do I necessarily blame uh, Anita for, because I've gotten ugly things as well now, mm -hmm. you know, from maybe, Maybe Anita fans, but the truth, in all honesty, they may not even be. It could Anita. be anybody. They may it not could just be trolls that want to see no, the show, right? Exactly. They may not even be Anita fans, right? They, but, but they're they're bringing it to me, bringing these negative things, threatening things, and but I'm not going to pay attention to that. I'm not going to blame that on her either. She doesn't. She does. We don't make people do what they do. Mm -hmm. We we write music, we perform it, and that's all. That's all we should be doing you know, is, is giving that. So listen, auntie, stand down, beehive, <laughs> stand down. Cause I know blue Ivy is somewhere on the Renaissance tour going like this, Ms. Baker next. <laughs> and not even blue Ivy has time for this, but no, I agree. But one thing that's important, the reason why I went through all the tweets and asked that wasn't just to be messy, but you know, I had to ask questions was because the cyberbullying is a real thing. Yes. We write stories on Hollywood a lot where kids are killing themselves who are being cyberbullied yes. for being gay or people are you know, committing suicide or, or harming each other over tweets or things like that. Yes. And so when you put things out there irresponsibly and it becomes a life, it takes on a life of its own. I saw in reports that she was accusing you of gaslighting your fans of cyberbully when we did all of our research and digging and we saw nothing from you. And so I just wanna change that narrative because this to me, this r and beef is a stain on, in my opinion, Anita Baker's legacy because you are so great and you give sweet love, but this isn't sweet. This is nasty and it's unfair. So I apologize I had to answer yeah, this question. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. And, and you're so right. The, the cyberbullying is, that, that's, it's a terrible thing. Mm -hmm. And the best way to deal with it is when you see those negative people, delete them. No, the best way is to go and announce your own tour. <laughs> <laughs> that, see, <laughs> I learned you can kill people online, but you really just killing your own self. You you kill them with success. You kill them with kindness. And yeah. you you've been a great example of this whole interview. I've been trying to bait this icon into getting you know into the mess, but he's just he's just too good. But you're you you have your own tour coming now. Yeah, we're, we're putting something together because everybody's asking for it. So let's do that. I've never seen you perform live. No, never. But I mean, uh -huh. I I want to. I I miss. The music. I miss just the music that makes you feel good and makes you think about the times where life was different, you know? Yeah. But I just remember, you know, the music and now just to see you still continuing to do music with artists who need guidance and leadership and um, artistry from somebody that actually knows the art of music. So it's great that you're, you know, killing it and now going to go on your own tour. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And I want to also say I met your girl. Um, she's here in the building. Um, recently, Janet Jackson, you know, she went viral because she kissed her dancer who's 23. I think she's 57. You're in a relationship and there's a gap. Do you think age matters of grown folks who are adults and adulting and making their own decisions? My name's Babyface. Huh? My name's Babyface. Okay, so, so in your relationship, you have a 30 year <laughs> gap in your relationship, right? I don't, yeah, there is. And I don't, I don't feel that. Um, do you feel that when we talk with each other? No, I yeah. don't. 
But again, I think it's social media. Why does social media have such an involvement in other people's love lives and relationships where if a, adulting, consenting adults are loving each other and it's creating a power and energy that's positive, why do people feel like they have to invite themselves to it? Um, well, that's always been the case. It's just that we can hear it now. We mm -hmm. can hear the noise. Um, we, we weren't able to hear it before because there was no place for them to have a voice. It was a magazine at a counter that you had to read. Yeah, the, and, and, and you couldn't put your opinion in there. So now everybody gets a voice. And that's, uh, that's wonderful and terrible at the same time. Because there's a lot of people that aren't great people, that aren't really nice people. And, and so you get, the, you get the ugly with the bad, you know. That actually just helped me with my issue. Because it really is social media. And if I just put it down, then I, I mean, as much as I can, right? I mean, yeah. you put it down. I mean, it really is just noise. You, you could sit there and read it and, and, and get all that hate and, 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 and get so bothered by it that it sends you the wrong place. Mm. Um, don't pay attention to it. Mm. You can't because no matter how strong you are, somebody in there is going to say one little thing that just might get you going. Mm -hmm. And then you might feel like, oh, I'm going to fight them back. I'm going to do this, that. You can't win with how many people are there out there on social media. You can't win. That, um, all you can do is be your, be your genuine self and stay true to that and, and don't apologize for being yourself. And just And be that and, and, and don't ha ha try to explain it. So for your question in terms of for me with the 30 year difference, I, I could have never imagined it, but I know that I don't feel any particular age. You know? Well, you don't look any particular age, too. When I last time we talked and you said you were 64, I wear like, I mean, yeah. you're well, they say black don't crack. I say black cracks if you're on crack. But <laughs> nonetheless, what is your thing? Jeans, okay. you know, my mama, my dad, money, you know, money ain't got nothing to do with anything. Money helps. No, it doesn't. Not well, we really. know you're right. They say you're worth over two hundred million dollars. When you do, you ever just roll over and look at your bank account and just mm -hmm. laugh? Worth over, I, worth over what? They said worth like two hundred million dollars. I don't know what I'm worth, but um, I can say this: that it's not really about money. It's, it's about being happy. Does two hundred million dollars make you happy? Two hundred. I know people with billions of dollars that are unhappy. We're miserable, actually. Yes. Yeah. So it's not. Yeah, money always helps you if you're in a good space. But if you're not in a good space, then it, it won't matter. Mm. So, you know, the thing is, is trying your best to, you know, do what makes you happy. And uh, and I think that keeps you that, that keeps you young. What makes you happy? My kids, you know, um, and uh, seeing seeing them happy. And. Um, it's. Uh, one of those things where when, when they're all together, we're all together, and then that's that's always fun mm. to 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 feel that. Um, wishing just the best for them, you know. And I think that other than that, it's um, you know, music you know makes me happy, mm. and and being able to work and being able to um, be blessed enough to still be here doing what I do. That's why. Um, as you said, we started off. How am I here in this situation with today? Who would have thought that I'd be, you know, in a beef? An R and beef. R and beef. You know, with Anita Baker. With Anita Baker. You know, um, in front of the world, and when I'm not even beefing, because I'm Insanity. not. Insanity. I'm not beefing. Yeah. I got. I got no beef. Yeah. Uh, don't want no beef. <laughs> You know, crazy people watching this show, they can really digest how good of a person you are by watching how many traps I've laid out for you that you have not <laughs> fallen into. Everybody's like, there you go, watch out. Okay. Um, so Nick Cannon was recently here. The first time I interviewed him, he had two kids. Now he has 12. Do you want more kids? Because I mean, 12 is, 12, Nick, I'll see you soon, but 12 is I'm a good, lot. I'm good. You're I'm good. good. Yeah. <laughs> 12 kids, that's a lot of kids. Because if you have 12 kids, as talented as you are, we need to have a We Are the World produced by Babyface. <laughs> And Nick, your kids and Nick. You okay. know, Nick can actually sing pretty good. He can't sing. He can. Really? Yeah. Matter of fact, when I see Nick, I'm going to have Nick sing something and I'm going to 
put it out somewhere because I didn't know Nick could sing. He can sing. We were talking about doing something together, and and I heard him heard a couple of things he did, and I said, okay, I could do I could do something with you. You and Nick Cannon will record a song singing together. Well, I mean, I was going to produce it. You know? Okay, yeah. if you okay, but you're not you singing. <laughs> I was gonna say, okay, maybe we can get a need on the remix. All right, well, listen, um, w- w- I'm hoping that uh, people can can see the interview and see the conversation that we had. Um, I wore Givenchy today because I know you know these people, right? Yeah, I do. What is your relationship with Givenchy? Uh, we just we just started, but I'm just um, I'll, I'll be going there for to Paris for the the men's show this uh, next week, I guess. And those of you watching this this top that he has on, that's Givenchy, because I know that hook right there. Yeah, I love that hook. Yeah, I know that. I love Givenchy, too, but I don't know the folks to give me a discount. And I, I've mm-hmm. been looking over photos. I mean, you're a fashion icon as much as you are a musical icon. But I did get you a gift. There's actually something right on the side there, if you oh. can get it. This right? Yes. Yeah. Open it? Yes, please. <laughs> we like to give our gifts, our guest gifts. And we heard that uh, you're in the fashion. And I'm sure after everybody watching this interview, they're going to be gagging. So that is our official gagging black hoodie sweater. And it has, that's not Savarsi Crystal. Those are actually cheap from China. But either way, <laughs> um, it's really nice. This is what I love it. Thank you. If I ever see you pictured in that, I will apologize to the trolls online. But it is a nice, it's comfortable, and it's warm. It's cold out here in L.A. I totally will be wearing it. Okay, great. All right. <laughs> all right. Well, now that we got into all of that, we're going to get into the fun part of the show that everybody uh, can't wait to see, and that's the games. Although uh, the icon is in a relationship, we are going to play Smasher Pass, but this is not the Smasher <laughs> Pass that you're used to. This is uh, a game where, you know, it's obvious, but we have a paddle right here on the side. There's a paddle. Okay. And usually this game gets a little messy, but we're going to talk about your fashion over the decades because you are (laughs) a fashionista and we got photos. And so we're just going to pop a photo up and I Uh want you to tell us if at the time it was a smash, is it a pass now or is it still a smash? Here we go. Okay. This look. Oh. Oh, you giving young Billy D. Williams right there. Okay, that's... (laughs) I think that's, you're going to say pass? I'm going to pass on it. What? That's fly. That's actually how Nick Cannon dresses today. <laughs> wow. When, uh, when was that? Dang. Well, based off of the hair, that's definitely 90s. It's like 80. Uh, and you don't like that look? Um, it's hard for me to look at that and say. <laughs> The way you were looking at right there, I know whatever you were singing, <laughs> Where'd you were y'all killing find it. that? I haven't seen that. that. Was 1987 from the Soul Train. See there? 87? You can't tell by the Soul Train dancer in the background. That girl was getting it. 1987. Yeah, that hair says everything. Okay, well, that hair was late. Okay, the <laughs> next look. Ah, uh, I'm going to pass. I'm going to pass on that one, too. But whatever. You're rich. You can, you can <laughs> afford one bad one. Okay, the next one. That's a smash. Ooh, that was cool. When was that? That was Versace. That was a. Uh, um, that was for um, like maybe for the cooling you so ninety something. Wait, did, was that shirt inspired by Prince? Because every time I've seen Prince, he's had something like that. Uh, Prince always did the ruffles, but that was just kind of like that was kind of the whole little look that Versace was doing at the time. Did you ever get a chance to work with Prince? We didn't work together. I definitely knew him a little bit, though. Mm-hmm. When people used to say Prince versus Michael Jackson, did you ever understand that, or did they're both icon, iconic in their own way? Early right? days, I, I, I was Michael. Really? Yeah. Why? Because he was just the consummate performer. Yeah, just so so just so huge. Mm. Um, wasn't taking into consideration the actual abilities of you know because all that Prince could do, mm-hmm. you know, and. Uh, uh, it's now you can't make a comparison because they're very different. Because they're very different. I'm surprised you didn't say Prince though, given the fact that you all both play multi- instruments. And yeah, but it's, it's it's just because the difference was is because my, Michael had this magical thing about him that he appealed to every age group, even to this day around the whole world. Around the whole world. So even to this day, if you play Michael Jackson videos, you will have kids falling in love with Michael Jackson all over again. Next one. Suspenders. That Oh, that was uh that was for uh 
kid's choice, yeah. I, it's a smash. I, it's a spin. I like okay, it. thank you. I get it. I'll give you that. You know how to dress. Did you dress yourself or have you had stylish your that whole was, life? That was me. No, that was me dressing myself. Okay, okay. The next one. Versace again. Wait, were you single in this photo? Because what, what was that baby face like? The baby face has been the same all the time. Um, I'm talking to myself as a third person. That See, baby face, he was a... Um, when was it? That looked like for the streets, baby face. Were you ever for the streets? 94. I was me and Tracy. Soul Train Wars. First out to you again. I'm proud of, I'm proud of Tracy's success as a producer. She's got I mean yes. I, I remember she owned this big old building right down the street with Edmonds in or Ed whatever yeah. on it. She yeah. was running things. I mean, we, we talk from time to time, but I'm proud. Aren't you happy that your ex wife has gone on to be successful on her own so that way you don't ever have to worry about anything? <laughs> I'm very I'm very we have a very good relationship. Um, I'm very proud of what she's done, what she's accomplished, and it's uh, been great for you know, for our family, for my boys, and she's been there. They've, they've worked with her as well, and it's, uh, it's a beautiful relationship. See, those of you who are learning how to co-parent or learning how to separate and still love somebody you've been with, y'all need to take some notes. I never understood why. Pe- I mean, people have their own reasons for breaking yeah. up in relationship, but I never understood like how you love somebody deeply, have such a history with them, and then it's just all this chaos, love and hip hop online. Like, why not just leave with grace and be happy? You got to be able to get rid of the pain. Mm. You got to be able to forgive yourself as well as forgive others. Do you mentor people? I do not. <laughs> You're too rich. You ain't got time. Rich people ain't got time to mentor. Okay, the next person. Oh, that suit is fire. What's that's that? a smash. Uh, I don't remember that one. That's, well, I don't know what that is, but that's the kind of suit that if you... If you turn a light on it, it turns different colors. Yeah, yeah. When was this? 1998. You can rock that again. Do you keep these clothes? Some of them I keep. In what, an archive or? Yeah, just in some storage somewhere. You should run a, because um, I could almost, I could probably fit some of this now. You should run <laughs> one of those la archives like Marlo Hampton where we can go rent your clothes. That's a whole other stream of revenue, but you okay. have $200 million. Dollars, you don't need it. Okay. <laughs> Next one. Wow. This was 2001. Really? I don't remember that jacket. It's definitely giving Eric Benet on top. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I particularly don't remember. Oh, yeah, that's when that's the whole uh, twist thing. Do you like uh, that? Huh? Do you like that look? No, nah, I pass on that. No. What? Why? I don't like the glasses. Okay. <laughs> the next one. You're somewhere being rich in the snow. You don't even have no jacket on. That's when you know you hopped out of a Hummer or something. The assistants are waiting. Your camera people took it. You got creases in your jeans. You've been rich your whole life. That's definitely a stylist. <laughs> next, next. Go to the next yeah, one. Yeah, I ain't even. <laughs> okay, I just talked about Evan Ross having his nipples out here somewhere. BET Awards. <laughs> you is out. Just young Kenny. I still have that shirt. Do you really? I do. Okay, I'm not ready to wear that yet. I'm still working on my body. Okay, I'll give that to you. No, 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 no. We're not doing see through and sheer. Okay, the next one. No, let's, I like that one. No, that's good. That's I like good. that one. That's a smash. Yeah, I'm with that. Okay, are you more of a suit guy than a jean guy? Or what? what is your, what, what, where do you feel most comfortable? Um, it's changing. Actually, you know, um, I've been trying a lot of different things. Actually, Rika's been kind of like hooking me up with different looks, so. Um, and I've been enjoying it. It's been fun. Mm-hmm. Okay, the next one. Okay. I love that. Do you know Givenchy necklace? That uh, clearly. I mean, I'm I'm still trying to get the connection at Givenchy so I can get mm-hmm. a, a a necklace like that. Wait a minute. So that is a mixture of is that that's a Gucci suit? Yep. And that's a Givenchy shirt. The shirt and and a Givenchy chain. Yes. Okay, so now are you stepping it up with fashion and become more of a fashionista? That's your thing. Yeah, you want to yeah. get in that lane. Yeah, um, well, I, I just I love it. You know, and it's, it's nice to look cool. But fashion is expensive. You have to be able to afford it. This is a lot. True. True. Yeah. It's not like it's a. Okay, we have one more look. That's more Givenchy. Yep. Okay, yeah. now the glasses are those. Where are, the, are those all pearls? Yes. And those are glasses you own? Yes. So you got to be rich, real rich, when you have pearls around your glasses. Does your stylist bring you... Because we know you're a glasses man. Are you a glasses collector? 
I have a lot of glasses. How many pairs of glasses do you think you got? I don't know because I, I damage a lot of them too because I'm not great with them. But I, I've had just hundreds of glasses over the years. So. Because you're rich. All right, we got the next game. And this is the last game that we're going to play. Now, this is a game called T or Tweet. T or Tweet. <laughs> I know. He like, who signed me up for this interview? All right, T or Tweet. Now, this is a game where I'm going to ask you a question. Now, you can choose not to answer the question. Okay. You can choose not to answer. You can either spill the tea or answer the question. Spill the tea and answer the question or not spill the tea. Oh, I see. Now, if you choose not to answer the question. What happens? Because <laughs> <laughs> that's what's going to happen. Dun, dun, dun. You have to tweet something that I chose, but you can't tell anybody that I, cho that I chose the tweet for two days. Please just say what, what I just answer the question. <laughs> okay, so there were rumors that you dated Tony Braxton at one point. Is it true or not? It is not true. Damn. Okay, well, I can't tell you. Okay, can I tell you what the tweet was going to be? What was the tweet going to be? Well, he answered the question so he doesn't have to tweet it. But this is why, for all of you watching the show, if you ever come on and this game happens, y'all better answer the question. <laughs> the tweet was going to say. <clears throat> <laughs> the tweet was going to say, dearest one, <laughs> you said I hate Beyonce. That's one person I can never hate and you can never be. Signed a star. Oh. <laughs> so I'm glad that you answered the question and I'm so glad that you came on the show. I just have to say I'm going to have a music lover there. Where we love you and we appreciate you. Congrats on the tour. <laughs> All right, make sure you get all those tickets for the tour. You might even catch me and Nick Cannon uh, singing a remix to something we have no... I, I think I just met you, right? <laughs> no, performing on stage with no, you. No, I just met you right now with that last... <laughs> oh, no, that, yeah. I, I saved that for the very end. Yeah, there is no... <laughs> <laughs> but it's such an honor to have you on the show. Like, I've, I've been a fan uh, forever and will be a fan forever. And I just, on behalf of people who love real music, just appreciate everything you've done because, you know, music is literally the thing that connects... Uh, people from different uh, walks of life, race, sexualities, uh, sexual identification, whatever. I mean, it just brings the world together. Yeah. And your music has, there's been memories, good memories, sad memories that we've all shared. Yeah. And you've been like uh, the head of that orchestra. And we just appreciate it. Thank you, bro. Appreciate it. Thank you. Great. Peace.